I want you to hit me as hard as you can. I'm Lance Felchuk for Air on the Heads, The Black Sheep, where we discuss and defend the genre's most divisive films. I love this time of the year. And no, it's not about cold weather, jackets, or you know, pumpkin spice. None of that nonsense. This is a time of year where everyone embraces horror. Put up the lights, the skulls, and the rest of the decorations. And done. Right, so let's jump into the horror subgenre that is more popular than ever. Since I've already covered my favorite zombie film, Day of the Dead, Romero's masterpiece in my opinion, I'd like to lean more into the horror comedy this time around. I've always loved Return of the Living Dead, and I'm here to support its sequel and give some love to its toxic brother, Return of the Living Dead Part 2. I should state that I am fully aware of the hate this movie gets. I've been watching horror since around the age of 5. Yeah, parenting was a bit different back then. I'm with the masses, and agree that the first is a masterpiece. Balances the tightrope of humor and dread to absolute perfection. The effects are golden era practical. And this. They would tear off my clothes. <laughs> Let's get some light over here. Well, well I, I saw this in grade school, and, and yeah, never forget. <laughs> See, before the internet, this stuck with you. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Listen, I'm not trying to be a creep here. It's best to let Mr. Freeman describe this better. I have to remind myself that some birds aren't meant to be caged. Their feathers are just too bright. <laughs> yes, they are. Part 2 was directed by Ken Wiederhorn, replacing original director and screenwriting legend Dan O'Bannon. This change in leadership is what really shaped this sequel into something different. I know this is pretty disliked, and I'd like to get a few gripes out of the way myself. I'm a fair man. No disrespect to Ken, but I don't think this was his genre. Unlike part one, this entry doesn't have the finesse of the well-timed dark comedy. It lost its edge without the gore, nudity, and 80s punk caricatures. And it doesn't have that classic score. But despite its utter failure to live up to everything part one did brilliantly, there's still a fun and entertaining little zombie movie tucked away in here. The movie X is a sequel and a reboot at the same time. To make matters more confusing, but also great, Frank and Freddy are sort of back by the names of Ed and Joey, played once again by Tom Matthews and James Karen. Same personality, same character arcs, but now grave robbers instead of warehouse workers. We get a Blues Brothers-esque meta wink wink by Matthews. It's like we've been here before. It's like a dream, this whole thing. You, me, them, everybody. And even a cameo by the returning Colonel with the vague, Jesus Christ, not again. These are the same drums from the first, now being transported across the country. Since the exact same plot points happen, it's best to take this as more of a comedic gateway horror remake of the original. The central character is Jesse, a dorky kid who stumbles upon one of the drums and tries to warn the government about the outbreak. He's joined by a young Bobby Briggs, his aerobic loving sister, and probably the most chilled doctor ever. This man cares about his car over the safety of these people. 30 years I've owned this auto, and I've never put a scratch on it. Give me that, Come on. I, I can't really argue with the guy. Now, not a group of cool punks this time around. But we make do with more of a family unit. Think the horror version of Adventures in Babysitting. Now, watching this as a young kid, I like the idea of everyone being relatively young. Hey, you're young at heart, Doc. Now, do I prefer 80s punks, including a pantsless girl? Yes. But there's a charm to the kids, which are also 80s tropes, trying to stay alive in the warm and comforting Southern California. Ash Brooks Tom is probably the best character and the closest thing we get to a commanding lead. Sorry, but Jesse is serviceable at best, and I'm being really kind here. Though his bully is kind of fun. You know, in an over the top yet perfect for the time, quintessential asshole. His obnoxious braces alone make him a first class douche. And let's give a little credit for killing the kid right off the bat. Also, straight up killing his dad. And then his mom. The movie basically said, 
eh, f this family. As we follow Tom and his newly adopted work family across town, we get set piece after set piece of them surviving the onslaught. And this is where the film shines, when it's having fun. We get a cool car top attack with an enjoyable severed hand gag. The ending scene at the power plant. I love 80s electricity. And who can forget the great hospital scene? Okay, the one thing I hope we can all agree on is how well this film looks. It captures the mood perfectly. Any good horror movie needs a distinct look. And they do a great job here. And they sort of match the original, and at times, they make it their own. Surprisingly, the DP on part two is none other than Paul Thomas Anderson's go-to, Robert Elswit. Yeah, Return of the Living Dead 2 has a future Oscar winner as its director of photography. Obviously told through a camp tone, everything still has a great haunted house look. I'm glad that they got Matthews and Karen back, and will always love their chemistry. No serene, nobody wants skulls that haven't already been buried. Come on, I mean, how are they gonna know the difference? It'd be dishonest to give them skulls that weren't buried. But this sequel will always feel a little off. You know, they really messed up on advertising this as a dark film, and not something more focused on camp and comedy. Return of the Living Dead, Part 2. Not to mention the removal of the original score. You know, because of some rights issues, which recently was restored thanks to Shout Factory. I don't hate the tone. In fact, I enjoy its campy dad humor and poor man's Spielberg vibe. You know, having a dorky kid lead an adult adventure. Show me right there! Hold it, hold it. Ah, uh, pardon me, but could you tell me who the President of the United States is? Uh, Harry Truman. It's accessible, it's fun, and something I'd argue every kid could see, even though I would say that about the first. And I don't think I'm alone on this. There must be a few of us on Joe Blow, Arrow in the Head the Degree, Jesse Shade. Now, you also grew up with this, I believe. Hello? Hello? Hello, hello! Shit. Eric Wolkuski. You're a defender of part two, right? Hey, buddy, you there? Hello? Chris Bumbray, you've always loved this one, right? Hey Lance, no, I've never seen Return of the Living Dead 2. In fact, I've never seen Return of the Living Dead 1 or Return of the Living Dead 3, although I remember the commercials when I was a kid with the girl that was putting the weird things in her face. Um, do remember hearing, though, something about Return of the Living Dead 2 that apparently it was almost a PG-13, but then they weren't able to get a PG-13 and became an R-rated movie instead, but then there was no gore in it and the fans were really upset, and a weird thing about how in the 80s, for some reason, all the home video releases of this movie had to change the musical score because there was some kind of music clearance issue that you could watch it with the original score on cable, but then on video and on the early DVDs, it wasn't there, and that it was very strange, and I don't know if it ever got resolved. I kind of like to see it uh, now, because, I mean, you seem to like it, and... I guess your taste is all right. Who knows? I don't really know you that well, I guess. Probably okay. I mean, I don't know. You seem to like Robocop 2 a lot more than I do, which is kind of strange. Ah, what's not to love? A murderous Little League team, suicidal Robocop prototypes, a foul-mouthed grade school drug lord. Us bald men need to stick together. Do I have my rose-tinted glasses on? Maybe. There have been far worse sequels to beloved movies, and, and some very recently. Like this car-stealing scene, rocking out Robert Palmer. I see Mr. Palmer as a great metaphor for this film. The early stuff is better, and the later material may be corny and goofy. Things get a bit weird, but eh, maybe there was too much cocaine. None of this has aged amazingly well, but we should still judge it on a lower and campier bar. And maybe I do have a bad case of loving this movie. Seems a bit cringy now that I'm reading it out loud. But unlike the 80s, Robert Palmer in this film, I wasn't on any cocaine when I wrote it. Is there anything behind us? 